Hello students, and welcome to our discussion of Chapter 7, Foreign Direct Investment. This is the first chapter of the second um, half of the, the course. Um, chapter 7 deals with foreign direct investment, money, capital, uh, resources, um, going from one country or one firm to a firm or business in another country. So this chapter um, attempts to address the question why firms invest in foreign markets and the reasons they make uh, those expansion decisions. Um, we look at a few options they may have and a couple theories as well. Um, we'll start this chapter discussion with looking at a um, really good example um, within Canada. Um, there was back in the mid 80s Canadian Tire um, decided that uh, perhaps they realized that they had thought at least that they had saturated the Canadian market so they decided that they were going to expand into the US so a question I, I would have for you if go back in time if you were on that board board of directors with Canadian Tire and uh, they came to you and said that the Canadian market had been saturated we are basically everywhere we can be in Canada. Um, if, we, if we want to, to continue to grow, we have to expand. And being that the U.S. is their closest geographical neighbor, you know, they decide to expand to the U.S. The question is, in which state or states would you uh, choose? Outside of Hawaii, because, well, that's going to be really difficult to get to, and even though it's nice and warm there, um, we'll just exclude Hawaii. So, um, give you a moment just to think about some obvious answers, choices at least. Um, Canadian Tire, they decided that they were going to probably not go with your choice. Your choice probably would be somewhere one of the northern states, um, Montana, North Dakota, um, eastern states as well just across the border they decided that they were going to go almost excluding Hawaii almost as far away as possible they decided that they were going to expand into Texas so they bought a chain of white stores the name of the stores was white stores uh, they bought that chain and uh, they decided as they entered that market or took over that chain that they were going to um, sell their items at a discounted price in order to uh, attempt to kind of gain market share. This discount price strategy is risky and perhaps if you've taken uh, marketing classes or other type of economic classes um, where you have discussed different pricing strategies this one does have some benefits but it also has that risk that uh, customers your consumers might um, might feel that you know the price is great but it must be because the quality isn't very good or there's some other reason why it's being sold at a discount so within three years a very short period of time uh, Canadian Tire lost over 300 million dollars um, this is in the mid uh, 80s so with inflation today that's over 700 million dollars the uh, various dealers that went to Texas, they collectively sued and they won. Uh, they sued for $400 million. Um, so at this time, they're almost a billion dollars. Probably with inflation, it's over a billion dollars uh, of losses that they've incurred. So basically what happened because of that, Canadian Tire fired the CEO, um, Muncaster, and they hired the former CEO of the white stores. So having not learned their lesson in the early 80s, maybe mid or the early 90s, Canadian Tire decided to open two auto parts in the U.S., but um, also bailed out after losing money. Um, so this is a really great example of a business trying to invest, uh, making various decisions and um, having their own kind of work done to determine you know where to expand and how to expand and we'll go into 
how to expand in other chapters. Um, other examples of organizations that have expanded, some um, correct or some successfully and uh, some not. So we can talk about um, the NHL, National Hockey League. They expanded, fearing that they had, you know, perhaps saturated the the colder markets. They decided to expand to the southern states in the U.S. Uh, most of those teams um, have a difficult time uh, filling their stadiums, their hockey rinks. Um, even uh, Tampa Bay, that uh, you know, our uh, good strong team, they uh, they struggle at the gate. Um, and of course, that all has various costs that um, flow back to the other teams. Um, any football fans out there? The CFL back in the 90s, they de they ex um, decided to expand, thinking that was one way to grow their um, their business. So they decided to expand and. And, uh, similar to what tech, um, Canadian Tire that they did, they thought, you know, perhaps if they were going to expand, you just go across the border, um, Montana, Idaho, North Dakota, where there's no NFL team, um, and it, it's close enough to the border where um, there's some similarities. But they decided to expand into the deep south, uh, California, Las Vegas, Baltimore, Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, Tennessee. If you are a U.S. college football fan, you'll recognize probably four or five of those states as being really big college football um, states. And so the CFL went down there thinking that they could compete uh, with the NFL. Well, the NFL is not in some of those states or in those cities that they went into, but also decided that they could uh, compete against, um, you know, those really big U.S. college um, uh, states to the point where even NFL doesn't go into law, uh, some of those um, co big college city cities because college football is very big on Saturdays, um, NFL plays Sundays, high school football is Friday, so it's really difficult for the CFL to get a, get a hold on those markets. Um, other examples of businesses that have tried to expand, uh, Tim Hortons Burger, uh, and Burger King, that merger, Target in Canada, we'll talk about that as well. Um, but various examples of uh, businesses that have failed, and we talk about the failures because there's a lot we can learn from them. Um, Target, um, they lost, you know, four to five billion dollars within a couple of years. Uh, generally, what the what we can learn from these examples is that the businesses that went into, or the uh, the decision to expand into these different markets, uh, just did not have sufficient homework done. And you'd think that uh, if you're going to spend that much money, that you'd want to do um, as much preliminary work as possible. But Target is a great example. Canadian Tire is also a great example of businesses that tried to expand. Um, and then, uh, you know, came back after losing a lot of money and then decided to uh, perhaps expand or grow their business in a different way. So we'll come back to the, uh, the example of Canadian Tire. Um, some basic definitions here, foreign direct investment. What we mean by that is the acquisition, construction, physical capital by one firm, country, into another country. Um, greenfield operations or investment is um, done mostly in developing nations. Mergers acquis uh, um, acquisitions we'll talk about as well. Basically that's more prevalent in developed nations. Uh, multinational enterprise, M&E, basically a firm that owns business operations in more than one country. Um, just some brief information there. We can we are going to talk about the flow of foreign direct investment. We also talk about the stock of foreign direct investment. Um, you know, those are you know some basic accounting terms. We can talk about the outflow, um, money going out, and the in, you know inflow of FDI, uh, FDI, basically that foreign direct investment coming into the country. 
uh, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNC TAD. Um, that's basically where you're going to find a lot of the uh, FDI information in terms of uh, numbers, the size of um, some of the, the investments and which countries are investing, which countries are being invested into. Just went over some of this material quickly because it's just uh, relative notes. Um, as it says there, the past 35 years, we've seen a marked increase in both the flow and stock of foreign direct investment. The world is opening up. We have more of a, that global economy, so there's more investment happening between nations. Um, so basically in 2015, 1.5 trillion U.S. dollars. During the past decades, the United States has been the favorite target of foreign direct uh, investment inflow, so money coming in to the United States. And this usually gets um, um, a t a students' attention because you think that if you are a company going to invest money in perhaps a developing or an undeveloped nation to kind of invest at the early stage and help that nation grow and be there as various industries and kind of gain profits uh, and revenue that way. But uh, basically this is showing as that information says that the United States is the favorite target because, as it says there, they're the, the um, only country in the world with a population of 200 million and a comparatively high GDP per capita. So a lot of people and um, income is relatively high. As it says there, simply means that there are a lot of Americans and they have a lot of money to buy stuff. I would add in there too that um, debt is easier to acquire personal debt is easier to acquire in the United States and they are more debt friendly in terms of you know it's a typical American consumer they're wealthy they have money and they love to spend and they're not afraid to go into debt um, the growth of FDI basically is, is a result of three different elements here that um, we'll discuss as well fear of protectionism is one of the reasons why FDI has grown. Basically that means that firms may not be able to export to the country if a nation is more protected, has that, that protectionism mentality where they don't want exports coming into that nation or they don't want nations importing into their, into their country. They're going to set up various policies that are going to prevent that trade coming in. One way to prevent that trade if you are another company or another nation is to actually set up um, and establish, establish yourself there so that your products are locally produced in that foreign market and they are no longer viewed as um, um, imports for that nation. You're, you are no longer exporting that home nation or that host nation is no longer exporting, I mean no longer importing, so then it's a win for, for both. Um, other another reason for the growth of FDI political economic changes there have been fewer restrictions on foreign direct investment deregulation privatization um, foreign direct investment creates jobs and increases GDP for both the home nation the nation that's um, investing and for the host nation the nation that is having the money come in it does create jobs and increases the GDP. And another reason for the for the growth of FDI is um, treaties between uh, various countries. One of the bigger reasons out of all the those reasons for the growth of FDI is generally it's it's better for the business to be as close to the final customer as possible. You can react faster to any kind of change tastes or preferences or and you decrease transportation costs. So as a business if you are selling products to a foreign market you know you want to be as close as possible to that uh, consumer. Um, so then you would set up establish yourself there and that's part of foreign direct investment. So we will continue discussion in the next video.